While Lisa and I were away, <clears throat> we did go to church. We were in Hawaii, and there are a number of UCC congregations in Maui. There was a tiny one very close to where we stayed. After visiting that congregation, <clears throat> excuse me, I've concluded that churches hold some things in common no matter where they are. Nobody sat in the front rows of that church either. And announcements that could be made in 30 seconds took about 20 minutes. There are differences, too, at Kealahu UCC. All the music was accompanied by ukulele. It was beautiful. Also, that church sat right on the edge of the ocean. Although, as the preacher noted, the space was configured in such a way that the people in the pews were faced away from the ocean, while only the preacher and song leader got to enjoy the view. She said the planners must have known that no one would have listened to the sermon with the Pacific Ocean right in front of them. Another difference? Worship started with blowing the conch shell in the four directions. It was beautiful. No matter how wonderful the trip, it's always good to come back home. I'm so glad to be here today and so grateful for this church. I'm also mindful that, once again, we're struggling with challenges, particularly the ones that COVID has brought to us. From what I can tell from every church-related organization's blogs and newsletters, and from talking with many colleagues in ministry, the crisis in churches brought on by culture and COVID lingers. And since the Bible, this collection of documents from ancient Hebrew and early Jesus followers, since the Bible was forged by communities in crisis, it ought to have a lot to say to us, particularly now. Today, we'll look at a type of story from the Bible, origin stories. Rachel Held Evans describes a time of crisis for ancient Israel, our spiritual ancestors. She writes, the people of Israel had once boasted a king, a temple, and a great expanse of land, all of which they believed had been given to them by God and ensured to them forever. But in the sixth century BC, King Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem, destroying both the city and its temple. Many of the Jews who lived there were taken captive and forced into the empire's service. Others remained, but without a king, without a place of worship, without a national identity. This catastrophic event threw everything the people of Israel believed about themselves and about their God into question. She's describing a time when people were afraid their sense of home and community was disrupted. They didn't know how to worship or engage in the rituals that had grounded them. To address this emotional suffering, Jewish scribes got to work putting together centuries of oral and some written material adding reflections of their own as they wrestled through this crisis of faith. If the people of Israel no longer had their own land, their own king, or their own temple, what did they have? Well, they had their stories. They had their songs. They had their traditions. They still had their God, who they believed to be faithful. They returned to their roots to solidify their understanding of who they were. Today, we still return to our roots in times of crisis. We return to the stories of our origins to ground ourselves, to make sense of things, to remember who we are. The role of origin stories in the Hebrew scriptures was to ground them. As Stacy said, we still have origin stories today, 
though they might take the form of family stories told around the kitchen table about how your grandparents met, or how you came to live in a certain home, or moved to a certain city. Significant relationships have origin stories. You know, when you first found that common interest with a dear friend, or stories of a child's birth, or stories of when you fell in love. These stories ground us. Origin stories enlighten the present by recalling the past. As Rachel Held Evans says, origin stories over the years morph into a colorful mix of truth and myth, nostalgia and pain. Ancient Israel's creation stories, two of them, are found in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. They describe a God who speaks and all that is comes into being. Let there be light. Boom. Those stories tell us about a perfect garden in which the first humans have everything they need and yet something goes wrong. These are stories that were not designed to answer scientific 21st century questions about the beginning of the universe or how humans came to be. The origin stories in Genesis were meant to address then pressing ancient questions about the nature of God and God's relationship to creation. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to recognize these genre categories for what they are. In the same way we automatically adjust our expectations when a story begins with once upon a time versus the Associated Press is reporting, we instinctively sense upon reading the stories of Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark that these tales of origin aren't meant to be straightforward recitations of historical fact. The Bible's original readers and writers may not share our culture, but they share our humanity. Their origin stories, in which they found strength and stability, can of course do the same for us, their spiritual descendants. The stories can also remind us of the power of our stories. Origin stories in our personal lives, in our families, in our communities, help us know who we are. And now, in our current time of exile from in-person gatherings, we can draw strength from them. The origin stories of First Congregational Church in Fort Worth help to shore us up so we can nurture each other and continue to engage in this work that God has given us to do. So let's take a quick look at our roots, our origin story. Here's where First Congregational Church in Fort Worth came from. In 1849, an army post was founded named Fort Worth after a war hero from the Mexican War, General William Jenkins Worth. Fort Worth actually came before Dallas, as we all know. 50 years later, in 1899, Fort Worth had grown to about 40,000 people, and it was time for a congregational church in Fort Worth. A man named Herbert Post, you'll hear more about his family in just a bit, a Fort Worth citizen, wrote that this was the best time to start a new congregational church in Fort Worth. In 1903, a call went out through the newspapers for all congregationalists to meet and organize a new congregational church in Fort Worth. That church is us, of course. The charter, filed in December of 1903, included 40 signatures. It's interesting to note that some of these signatures were from children. A modest chapel was then built for $315. By the way, a newspaper article about our church from 1903 says that among the members are some of the best families of the city. It also says 
that this new church's theological stance included the possibility that it might not believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus. The article concludes, this is in harmony with the so-called new theology and shows that these people are up to date in the matter of religious thought and tendency. Though the church owned a chapel, we did not own land, and after a few years, plans were made to purchase land and build a more permanent structure. Once again, the Post family came through. C.W. Post was chairman of Postum Cereal Company, who made grape nut cereal and other products. His main rivals were the Kellogg brothers. C.W. Post was a marketing genius who proclaimed that grape nuts built red blood cells, studied the nerves, and prevented malaria and consumption. C.W. Post lived in Battle Creek, Michigan, but his parents lived in Fort Worth, and guess where they went to church? First Congregational Church. On behalf of his parents, the founder of Postum Cereals donated funds to build the first permanent structure for our church. It was located on Pennsylvania Avenue. It would be our home until 1950 when we moved to this building. Ground was broken and construction began in 1949 on seven acres of land given to the church. A newspaper article at the time said that the church was on one of the highest hilltops in the area. The first service held in the new church in this sanctuary was on March 5, 1950. The new church was idealistic in its goals. It wanted to be, quote, a social, cultural, civic, recreational, spiritual center, not only on Sundays, but also throughout the week. The capital campaign at the time assured members that they were purchasing stock in a better world. Through the years, some things have changed, but much has remained the same. Going to this church is a way of investing in a better world. And we are part of a long list of forward-thinking people who were passionate about justice and who are called to acts of compassion. We strive to know God simply as love and to put that love in action in the world around us. We embrace faith with curiosity and creativity, and therefore we believe that kindness is the true test of our faith. If something in our faith tradition counters kindness, common sense, or scientific consensus, we reinterpret it or we abandon it. This is who we are. And our work continues, pandemic or not, in person or not, in all of the ways we come together, in all of the ways we grow and serve and love. Joan Didion wrote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. When we understand the function of origin stories, both in our culture and in our lives, we can make better sense of those that are found in the Bible. The creation stories of Genesis spoke of a God who makes order out of chaos. Story reminded them, and us, that God needs no building of stone from which to reign. God dwells in every landscape, in every home. Should all other identities or securities be thrown into tumult, should nations be fractured and temples torn down, this truth remains. God is with us. It's a story as true now as it was then. Now today, immediately following worship, in just a few minutes, we'll start a new series in Adult Ed based in part on a book by Rachel Held Evans from which some of the quotes I've used today are taken. We'll be looking at stories and passages from the Jewish and Christian scriptures with a critical lens, hearing what biblical and historical scholars have to say 
and seeking truth and sharing our questions. Adults and youth are invited. The link is in the comment feed. Please join. Pastor Stacy will meet with the children. If you need that link, please drop a comment and we'll see that you get it. A big part of who we are is the strength we draw from coming together. So I hope that you'll take just a bit of time to be a part of this community. Friends, let's grow and build friendships and serve and thrive together.